Welcome to Reducing Poverty from Theory to Practice. Um, so yeah, as Liz mentioned, some of this will be old hat for you, but this will be potentially new information for some of you. Um, and to start off, well, what is Vibrant Communities, or VC, or VCC as we call it in its short form? Uh, well, simply stated, it's a learning community for cities with comprehensive poverty reduction strategies that are led by multi-sector roundtables. And it all started in 1996 with this initiative called Opportunities 2000, which was launched in Waterloo, Ontario. And this was a place-based uh, poverty reduction um, initiative with the goal of moving 2,000 families out of poverty by the year 2000. And by the end of the year 2000, it surpassed its goal. So moving forward on the next slide, in uh, 2002, Vibrant Communities Canada, or VC, uh, came into being and 13 trail builder city partners joined us to undertake an action learning experiment to see if the place-based approach that was applied in Waterloo could move the needle on poverty in other communities across the country. Uh, and the work of the trail builders lasted about 10 years, ending in 2012. And that 10 year period between 2002, 2012 is referred to as phase one of vibrant communities. So what exactly was their approach? Uh, well, essentially the whole idea was that we needed to change the culture of poverty and poverty reduction um, and shift it to a comprehensive multi-sector approach in which communities could raise the profile of poverty and build a constituency for change, encourage collaborative ways of working, begin to shift systems underlying poverty to address the root causes, and generate changes for a large number of people living in poverty. In terms of the results uh, after the 10 years of uh, work with the trail builder cities, uh, really thousands of participants and organizations uh, developed over 250 initiatives that ended up touching the lives of, of approximately, uh, well, over 200,000 households. And what this really begged the question of then was if 13 cities could have such a huge impact, what could the impact of 100 cities reducing poverty look like? And if you go to the next slide, this outlines our goal now in what we understand as phase, uh, phase two of vibrant communities, which we call cities reducing poverty. And our goal collectively is to reduce poverty for 1 million Canadians. Going to the next slide. Um, so in its second iteration, in its second iteration the, uh, the VC network, or Cities Reducing Poverty, as we know it, it has grown to 45 fully connected member cities, which uh, you'll see represented here on this map. Um, there are many other communities um, who are also loosely connected to us and learning with us. Um, and these local groups on this map here are um, particularly what defines them as Cities Reducing Poverty members um, is that they've paid an annual membership fee to join our, you know, our national network, um, to be involved in a, in a learning community. Um, they've made commitments to the network, and in turn, they get very tangible benefits, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. And then next slide. Uh, this tells you a little bit about what together we've committed to as a network. Um, so we're learning from each other and scaling up what's working uh, more quickly. We're trying to make the work easier and more effective um, by learning from each other rather than recreating the wheel. Um, we are, we've displayed a commitment collective through a poverty reduction charter, which several cities have signed on to. Um, we're advocating for municipalities to lead through a business case for poverty reduction. There are several uh, municipalities in the, in the membership who are, who are leading in this area. We're shaping a national policy agenda around several policy issues together, and we're researching models of campus community engagement for policy change. We've also launched a Canadian Living Wage Framework and Campaign, that was in 2014, um, and we're measuring change together, um, the collective change that we're, or the impact that we're having as a network through a common evaluation framework. Um, a huge milestone for the Cities Reducing Poverty Network was this National Poverty Reduction Summit that we held in Ottawa this past May. Um, and it was a first for Canada and a first for the network and a huge success in terms of moving towards aligning our municipal or local uh, and provincial and federal strategies around poverty reduction. Kirsty, before you go on to the next slide, do you want to just briefly talk about what you're planning for 2016 building on the first Poverty Reduction Summit? 
Yeah, so it's quite exciting actually. Um, we've got commitment from uh, Mayor Don Iveson in Edmonton uh, and city folks there to bring um, what will be the, the city's reducing po poverty gathering to Edmonton, um, April 5th through the 7th uh, are our dates. Um, and we've got backing from Mayor Nenshi in Calgary, as well as the Federation of Canadian Municipal Municipalities. Um, so it's gonna be a big event and the focus will be on uh, local poverty reduction efforts, really bringing emphasis to how cities are reducing poverty um, in Canada and the role of mayors in that effort. It's, I think it's going to be a fabulous event. So that might be of particular interest to the communities in BC who are um, working very much at the local level to bring in their poverty reduction roundtables and their mayors to this uh, to this session. And you guys on the phone are one of the first groups to hear about this. It's in the early planning stages, but you'll uh, learn more soon. Mm -hmm. So this next slide just outlines some of the, the top ways that our cities are really going around. Um, reducing poverty in their local communities. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of them for you. Um, so the first is that municipal governments are taking the lead in creating poverty reduction strategies. And I just want to highlight the case of Edmonton here. Um, Don Iveson in 2014, Mayor Don Iveson invited 18 local leaders to develop a mayor's task force with the goal of ending poverty in Edmonton within a generation. And the task force uh, has worked really on building efforts that were already existing within the community. So um, an alignment with the government of Alberta's poverty reduction strategy and the work of uh, the, the trail builder community um, organization that was in Edmonton. Um, and the task force has just come out with a 10 year action plan to reduce poverty. Um, we're actually gonna highlight the Edmonton story in a webinar coming up in October. So we'll make sure that we include a link to that opportunity to join the webinar in our follow up email after this, uh, after the broadcast. And then a second one I wanted to highlight um, was another government related one in that uh, act cities are actively engaging in advancing the creation uh, of or renewal of provincial or territorial poverty reduction strategies. Um, and in Saskatoon, our partners there have created a, they created a poverty cost Saskatchewan campaign as part of their work and then use that to get the province to commit to developing a poverty reduction strategy. And just this month, uh, they released their recommendations for the strategy um, with the overall target of reducing poverty in Saskatchewan by 50% by the end of 2020. So ambitious, but uh, moving in the right direction. Absolutely. Moving to the next Thanks. slide. Um, so just we just wanted to highlight here, actually, Liz um, brought our attention to this. Uh, the Brookings Institute just released a new paper um, that shows two anti-poverty strategies that are uh, primarily used in the states. And, and the thing to highlight here is, is that really in Canada, our strategies are quite similar to the, to the ones here, which are um, to raise the income of those with low incomes, and then also to reduce the knock-on effects of having low income on housing, schooling, safety, healthcare, uh, or, or in health in general. So one of the things that, well, really Vibrant Community's goal is um, our small staff is, uh, is here to help our member collaboratives reduce overall po poverty in their communities. And we're here to connect you to others who are doing the work um, and to connect you to resources and tools that will make uh, your work easier. And some of the ways that we do this is by offering um, learning opportunities like communities of practice, which are monthly or bi-monthly calls um, based on a particular topic related to poverty reduction um, that members will come and, and learn from each other, um, ask questions to each other around that particular topic. Uh, one of our most popular ones right now is called Getting to Impact, Planning for Poverty Reduction, where we bring in presenters um, who tell us about their poverty reduction strategy. How do they build it? How do they decide on the priorities? What was the community engagement process like? Um, that kind of a thing and reporting on uh, results if they've already implemented one. So that's a good one if you're just getting started in your, in your journey of uh, putting together a round table or getting a strategy in place. Um, we also run about 10 webinars uh, a year in vibrant communities. Um, again, also on poverty related um, uh, subjects. Um, next week, on September 23rd, we have a webinar um, on economic security, moving towards uh, building vibrant, healthy communities. 
Um, so we'll include a link to that as well in our follow-up email for you to check out. We have a monthly e-newsletter that we send um, that includes links to all the hot news, uh, opportunities, tools and resources, and poverty reduction. Um, they're really quick links, so it's really easy to just scan and, and get what you need from that. Um, we also do the face-to-face -face events, as we told you about earlier. We did the National Summit uh, back in Ottawa this May, and we've got the Edmonton one coming up. That's a staple every year. We get our cities together. And in 2016, we're looking to advance a coaching program where peers are going to be mentoring one another, um, as well as we'll have uh, some external coaches available to you to help advance your poverty reduction activities. We also have online resources all over our website, which is uh, vibrantcanada.ca. Uh, really great practical resources like job descriptions and poverty reduction strategies, um, lots of evaluation tools. And the other thing that we um, are working on now is, uh, is solidifying our common evaluation framework. So as a network, we need to understand what is our collective impact and how are we moving the marker on poverty in our local communities. Um, so we have a, a strategy for that um, and a capacity building support built in. Um, and in addition, we are purchasing uh, population level indicators from the community data program, which each of our member communities receives annually um, to help them understand how, how their poverty measures are changing. And before I, I give it off to Liz, there's two more slides here. Um, what I'd love to do is, is to get you to subscribe to Cities Connect. Uh, first of all, that, that monthly e-newsletter e for poverty reduction practitioners. Um, another great one is Engage. This is our Tamarack-wide monthly e-magazine for community change leaders. It features great blogs and uh, articles from across Tamarack's three communities. Um, and I also want to encourage you to join our online community on the website, vibrantcanada.ca. You see here just a little profile of what my, my own profile looks like on there. Um, when you join, it gives you a chance to blog and post as you wish, um, and you can also connect in with other members on the site um, and get access to them that way. And I would love for you to email me if you have any questions or are interested in learning more about vibrant communities, please email me at kirsty at tamarackcommunity.ca. And I would love for you to follow us on social media. We are always updating our Twitter and Facebook feeds with updates and news and tools and great links like that. So certainly hope you check that out. And that great. is the end. Yeah. Great, thanks, Kirsty. I'm going to um, we're going to go into our next slide where we're going to think about poverty. But I'm just going to do something really quickly. I noticed that my emails were um, coming in. I didn't shut my email prior to coming onto this webinar, which is a bad thing to do. So I'm just going to get out of that quickly. Shut my email account so you don't see my emails come in. Um, and away we go with the presentation. So I, uh, I'm going to take the next portion of the webinar to really uh, give you some of the thinking that we have at uh, Tamarack and at Vibrant Communities around, you know, how do we think about poverty? How do our communities think about poverty? Because when you understand kind of some of the major thoughts behind poverty, the conception of poverty, it actually really helps your communities then identify strategies for moving forward. And so um, hopefully today will be a little bit of a, a refresher for some of you because you've already, you're already doing work around poverty reduction. So it'll be a refresher probably of some of the conversations that you've had. And it also might be, it might uh, provoke some additional thoughts. For sure, if you have any questions as you go along, please put them into the question box. And Natasha, feel comfortable in stopping me at any point if there's a particular question and people want to dive in a little bit deeper about it, I'd be happy to, you know, pause and get through um, those questions while they're still relevant and pertinent for folks. Um, this slide is actually comes out of a really great uh, resource that TV Ontario did um, a couple of years ago. They were um, part of an international movement of uh, public broadcast channels that were looking at um, the issue of poverty. And over the course of a number of months, they developed a lot of resources. They developed a number of um, uh, tools on their website and a number of videos. So um, feel free to go to the TV Ontario Why Poverty 
um, site. But I thought what was really interesting, this was a one pager that they developed about um, poverty in Canada um, and really looked at uh, kind of who's impacted by the issue of poverty and then also where Canada lands in terms of other countries and um, the amount of uh, poverty um, that we have in our country and the amount of poverty that's in other countries. Um, so where we stand in, in relative comparison. If you look at the um, center box in terms of the percentage of Canadians being impacted by um, poverty, in BC, you uh, at the time that they developed this uh, this one pager, you were experiencing um, you know poverty. Um, I think I'm not sure exactly what the rate is, but if you look at the line here, you know 10% of the folks that they um, identified said that they had to see, uh, sleep in the street or on the shelter um, in uh, in that year and 26 percent identified that they had to go to a food bank or a charity for help and you know I think we have the folks that live in absolute poverty so the ones that are sleeping on streets or having to go to shelters and then there are uh, a, a pretty large percentage a larger percentage of our population where you know people are economically vulnerable right so they might go from time to time to a food bank or from time to time to charity for support, but they're not necessarily um, always in those circumstances. And I think that that's important to kind of consider. In Canada, unfortunately, we don't have a single measure of poverty. And so that makes it very difficult because across the provinces and territories, um, there are a number of different measures that are used. These are the three most popular measures, the low income cutoff, the low income measure and the market basket measure and, and Statistics Canada reports on these three measures. In some cases um, uh, and particularly in the territories for example, the population is so dispersed across the territory that it's difficult to get a low income cutoff measure. Um, so what we've landed on from a vibrant communities perspective and what we use in the common evaluation framework is the low income measure. It's a standard measure that is used not only in Canada by Statistics Canada but also internationally. And one of the things, the reason why we landed on the low income measure as a measure for um, thinking about poverty, there were a number of provinces that were already landing on the low income measure, but we also, um, one of the key indicators that uh, we use in our common evaluation framework is uh, tax filer data. And so low income measures is, is largely drawn from tax filer data. You know, there are limitations on the measures of poverty. Um, so this is what we have seen across Canada. Um, not even if you were to say, okay, we're gonna land on the low income measure, for example, you know, then people would say, okay, so that's based on income. What about affordability, right? And each of our communities, each of our cities has different levels of affordability. So it's probably, if you're living in Hamilton, Ontario, it's probably much more affordable to rent an apartment and to buy a house than it is Vancouver, BC. So, you know, the market basket measure gets a little bit at affordability, but isn't necessarily completely about affordability. So there, there's all sorts of challenges with landing on a single measure, um, but it is important to kind of have an understanding of, you know, who's living in poverty. So I would say, you know, while there isn't a, um, th there are challenges with each of the measures, um, look at the challenges in the measure, but also it is important to get an understanding based on the measure that you select about, you know, what's the experience of individuals in your community based on that measure. Um, in some cases, this is really challenging work, or what we found is this is really challenging work for vibrant community partners or for communities that are engaging in poverty reduction work. And so we would suggest going to your local municipalities or, you know, if you have a social planning council in your community and, and other people that are connected to data and measures and get them involved in the conversation about, you know, what measures should we be looking at in Surrey or Abbotsford or in any of the other communities that you're working in and then try to really use that to frame a picture of who lives in poverty in your community and then what are, you know, how would we understand that from a statistical perspective. Um, that's, I think, a critical first step in um, any kind of poverty reduction strategy. 
Um, this slide uh, is a resource, and I'm, I apologize for the fuzziness of the resource. That's what happens when you go to Google Images and you try to take uh, uh, something off of Google Images. But a colleague of ours, a couple of colleagues of ours at Tamarack put together a compendium of poverty reduction strategies and frameworks. This uh, resource is available on the Vibrant Communities website. You can download it. What's really interesting about this uh, resource is that they, you know, when Kirsty went through the 10 poverty reduction strategies, um, this resource actually looks at those strategies and provides, you know, the content of this webinar in a nice resource that you can um, utilize and uh, share with colleagues uh, um, in your communities. So now let's get into the meat of it, right? Um, so defining poverty, this is, this is the critical thing. So how we define poverty actually helps us determine the type of strategy or the types of goals that we're going to put into our poverty reduction approach. So if we are like the Fraser Institute, right, um, and say that, you know, the only type of poverty that we have in Canada is around absolute poverty, right, the people that have absolutely no resources to meet their physical needs for survival, right? Those are folks that are, you know, maybe uh, on uh, living on the streets, um, have no uh, kinds of income supplementation that comes in. Really, if that's the way that we look at poverty, if that's our conception of poverty, then our goal or our strategy is to develop programs and services that meet their basic needs, right? And so that would be very much, um, you know, really focusing on uh, shelters for them, uh, getting them food, and perhaps getting them some income. But if, on the other hand, we look at poverty as, you know, exclusion or capabilities deprivation, then we actually um, have, a, ha have a focus that is really much more around what are the strategies that, you know, people who live in poverty are not included in, um, in our society in the way that everybody else who, who has more resources are included in our society, right? So the idea behind um, a poverty as exclusion is that we have certain processes in our um, communities, in our society, that really are exclusionary processes. So if you live in poverty, you're spending so much of your time going to the food bank, looking for shelter, trying to navigate the um, social assistance or income assistance uh, um, area. You might be living in poor neighborhoods. There might not be affordable transportation in those neighborhoods. So there's lots of things that are keeping you um, in poverty. There, you know, we've often referred to that in Canada as kind of um, uh, the traps, right, of poverty. So then you want to figure out a strategy or a set of goals that really are about more inclusion. And if you think back again to that slide of the 10 strategies that have been um, uh, moving forward in Canada, many of them have an inclusionary, uh, um, an inclusionary focus to them, like access to affordable transportation, access to post-secondary education. So they are less about basic needs, although there are ones that um, tackle basic needs, but they seem to be more in the inclusion and human development uh, timeframe. Um, so really, the question would be in defining poverty, what is the perspective in your community around these five different definitions, and then how do you move forward around those kinds of perspectives? And this, I put this slide in here because it does make a really interesting conversation, you know, one of those early conversations in your poverty reduction um, uh, discussions. So again, uh, this is another way of looking at it. So if you say, okay, it's only about basic needs, then it's really focusing on income and really meeting the basic needs. And if it is about, you know, human development and social inclusion, then you want to look at this more inclusive approach. So this is just a, another way of looking at it. And then this slide really actually takes you through, you know, what then would happen? What are the strategies that would come out of where you land on that kind of poverty continuum, right? So absolute poverty, as I said, you know, interventions like food banks and homeless shelters and emergency health care clinics, uh, dependence, if you use poverty, if you focused on poverty as dependence, you might want to look at things like economic self-sufficiency, 
job training, uh, earned income tax credits, etc., for the working poor. And then if you focus, you know, at the other end of the continuum, there are things like, you know, anti-racism programming, uh, strengthening democratic processes, etc. So, you know, we're not. Uh, what we've seen in in uh, Canada is that, in fact, um, our vibrant communities do tend to land more at the inclusion, human capabilities perspective, but they also recognize that some of that uh, some of that other uh, those really tangible supports also need to be in our communities because we're not fully as a Canadian society um, uh, fully around. On to human capabilities focus. So again, uh, this is another way of looking at poverty. So we have the five kind of points on a kind of a continuum, but then there's also, you know, the experience of poverty, right? So in our communities, once you actually learn about, you know, who is living in poverty in your community, you also want to ask the question, well, what's their experience? And so do we have a high number of people in our community that are transitional, right? The, because of economic circumstances in our community, they might transition in and out of poverty. And a really good example of this is in Grand Prairie, Alberta, where um, it's very much gone oil calendar, right, or the gas and oil calendar. There are times where, you know, there's lots of supports in the community and lots of income coming in, and then there's a shutdown period in that community, and over a course of three to six months, you know, the income that those families were experiencing transitions into something else, and so then there are more needs for different kinds of supports in the community, so that's transitional. We also see in the life course of folks that they'll transition. There might be a, um, a, an illness that that family faces, and all of their resources have to go to support a family member. So for a short period of time, they, they might have to um, transition into a low and limited income, or there might be um, they might lose a job. So that's kind of transitional poverty. There are um, uh, issues of chronic poverty where, you know, and, and we see this in uh, certain communities where um, it's a resource community, right, like a mining community, and then the mine shuts down, and, the, you know, the impact of that um, is connected to the economic vibrancy of that community, and so there are lots of dimensions to that, that chronic kind of poverty. And then we see also intergenerational uh, poverty where it's multidimensional and cyclical. And again, thinking about strategies that you might use in each of these three areas is critical, right? So if you have a lot of transitional poverty in your community, there might be different strategies than you employ that you employ than if you have a lot of intergenerational um, poverty in your community. So I think that that's really getting a sense of, you know, what's happening in your community is really helpful in this way. Um, some of the causes, and this is, you know, this is, uh, this gets into a little bit of um, some of the kind of negative parts and the negative perceptions about co uh, poverty, right, is to really kind of think about the causes. What causes poverty, you know? And these are um, ones that have been out there. They're a bit <coughs> concepts <coughs> that are a little bit pervasive in our society. So is it, you know, individual de uh, deficiencies? Is it that we have a culture of poverty? You know, is it about situational poverty or is it structural? And again, depending on where you land in your community, the strategies that come out of this <clears throat> are really based on, you know, your cultural understanding of it, but also, you know, your bias in terms of the types of action that you're going to undertake. Sorry, I have a little bit of a tickle in my throat, so I'm, I'm <clears throat> trying to, uh, to address that. Also, <clears throat> when we measure poverty reduction progress, where we land in our theory or our understanding of poverty also says, okay, how are we going to measure this, right? Are we going to use the poverty line as a measure? And what's the advantage of using the poverty line as a measure? If we say, no, it's about uh, human capability advancement, then we might look at wealth and income gaps. And how do we uh, use that data 
Um, if it's about building assets, then what are the path pathways or the assets or capability or capacity building that we need to do? And this just this slide really just gives you a kind of a sense of um, uh, how to met what some of the measures might be, and then you know what the how we can track progress. <coughs> but, uh, at Tamarack and through vibrant communities, um, the common evaluation framework actually lands us on both the poverty line, so we use low income measure as a measure, but we also look at some of the other um, gaps that happen in a community from an income perspective. So we've, we've taken the first two, and then we also look at building assets. So what we the combination of those three categories really gives us I think a, a, a full picture of not only yes are we are we getting to the net 1 million people less poor in Canada and then we're also looking at what are the most effective strategies for moving people out of poverty so looking at asset and capacity building or pathways out of poverty we can say yeah, you know, uh, affordable transportation is a great strategy for moving people out of poverty and their pathway out of poverty because affordable transportation gets people to jobs um, that are going to pay them a wage and so that moves them out of poverty. So we, I, I think at um, vibrant communities, what we're trying to do is to really build um, the different components together. And this slide really actually starts to talk about that, right? So. You know, a comprehensive framework, as I, as I said earlier, a comprehensive framework really says, okay, so, you know, at the top of the framework, we want to really get at the net number of people less poor in our community, that sustained poverty reduction, that we are actually seeing less people in our communities being poor. We know that they're going to be less poor when they have increased access to uh, financial assets to personal assets to physical assets like uh, um, uh, safety and um, affordable rent and access to transportation and also to uh, human and social assets. They, there are pathways that can take people there and then the foundations that we need in place. And you can, and the foundations actually speak to those kind of core uh, things that we need in our communities um, that really meet the needs of the people living in absolute poverty. So, so this this kind of house that we're building around poverty reduction, I think, is a a really nice kind of um, analogy of how the change can happen. And at uh, vibrant communities and at Temerac, what we've seen is that we need these different levels of action, right? But we also need to work on the wider systems communities, organizations, and households. One of our partners um, in Saskatoon actually took this framework and said, oh, this makes a lot of sense to us, and they built their poverty reduction strategy around that framework. And you can, you can see how they, they took the kind of thinking that we had a couple of years ago at, uh, at Vibrant Communities and said, you know, this is really what we're doing, and this is their theory of change, and they call it the Saskatoon uh, Poverty to Possibilities Framework. And so what they're doing in this framework is that they're saying, you know, we know that there is a continuum from people in crisis to a community that is thriving, and we have to work across the continuum. It's a big amount of uh, a big focus. There are some vibrant community partners that are more focused that might just say, you know, of these five that they've identified education, health services, employment, income, and housing we in our community are going to focus on employment, income, and housing, for example. So um, Saskatoon is very comprehensive, but we have also seen across our vibrant community partners um, a more focused strategy as well. Um, and I would say, you know, where you land is based on your local context, right? So if you have, you know, um, lots of kids that are dropping out of high school in your community, then you might say education is what we have to focus on um, because we see it as a real barrier and kids that don't graduate high school are more likely to end up in poverty. So, so again, the local context is really critical in, in um, how you define your poverty reduction strategy. Um, the other thing I think that is really important is to think about language, right? And this again comes from the folks in Saskatoon. 
Um, so they did a little bit more thinking about, you know, is it that we're going to use familiar language or are we going to use new language? So you've seen a lot of um, work out there in the last couple of years about, you know, do we use the do we use the term poverty or, or do we use the term inequality, for example, or do we use economic stability, right, um, or a thriving community? Again, we're not saying uh, that there is a perfect answer. Again, it's local context, but it is also really critical to think about you know, where we land has to fit within our local context, right? And so we've seen across our vibrant community partners and across the poverty reduction work in Canada, all sorts of variations. In um, New Brunswick, for example, they have an economic, economic and social inclusion strategy. That's their poverty strategy, right? In other communities, they've said, no, you know, uh, we need to use the word poverty because we've got to change the conversation around this issue. So really, here's some thinking about it, but also, you know, you've got to use, um, use your local context to, um, to also consider it. So, you know, uh, again, again, this slide is really, uh, uh, again, pulling that concept of how are we going to talk about poverty? Are we going to talk about poverty? Are we going to talk about social inclusion? Are we going to talk about economic inclusion? Are we going to talk about in inequality? Is it a problem or is it a possibility? You know, that's, again, a, a two different kinds of framing. Is it about the individual and the family or is it about the community and the society? And again, you know, if you think about those five things, um, those five different framings, this again is kind of thinking through what are the possibilities here for us to consider. Um, so here are some myths that are common, and we know that, you know, uh, if you think about um, what uh, Kirsty talked about earlier in terms of the 10 uh, strategies that we've seen evolve across vibrant communities in Canada, one of the core early strategies that we see is to change the conversation in our communities around poverty and to increase the understanding of people living in poverty. And so this, you know, this framing discussion is a really important one. And so these are myths that we have heard time and time again. And so what we've seen um, communities do to respond to these myths is they do things like build an economic case for why poverty impacts the broader community. Um, we've seen uh, when you get an understanding of, you know, people will say, oh, the poor, you know, if they only got a job, right? Well, in certain communities, when you start to understand who lives in poverty, in Hamilton, for example, the people who live in poverty, 26% uh, of them are working full and part-time. So it's not that they don't want to work, it's just that the system um, doesn't value the work um, that they're doing. So we're not paying a living wage or there, there's precarious work available in our communities. And so understanding your local context really helps you kind of address some of these myths that are out there around poverty and it really helps you build a strong case for your poverty reduction strategy. So the really important points before I jump into the next piece, the really important points are where do you land on those five ways of conceiving poverty? Um, what do you know about the people who are living in poverty in your community from a demographic perspective? And then how are you going to build your change strategy and how are you going to talk about poverty? Those are four really important things to consider in moving um, from theory into practice. That's the theory behind it then how do you actualize it for the context of your community? I've got um, a couple of more slides to go through. Uh, these are just uh, really quickly some of the approaches and lessons that we've learned um, across Canada. Um, one is that we know that poverty is complex, and this comes out of the work of Sherry Torshman, that there isn't a single cause or a single solution. And that's why, you know, that whole set of slides I just presented makes it much more difficult for us to do this work, right? Because what works in Surrey may not necessarily work in Ab Abbotsford 
or may not work in Vancouver, but what are the lessons that we can learn as we build this kind of network of people that are um, working on poverty reduction? And I think that that's the value of the work that you're doing across the seven cities um, in uh, BC, but also uh, across the work that's happening both across Canada and across BC as well. Um, the other things that we know are some of the conditions for success, right? So engaging the broader community in this informed discussion around poverty is really a critical condition for success. Making sure that the solutions or the strategies that you're going to undertake in your community have the support of all sectors. And this means that you have your business community engaged, you have your not-for-profit, your uh, local leaders, your local government leaders are engaged, but you also get support from all of the sectors. Um, using the, the sense that poverty, that we are making traction on poverty in Canada, right? So we do have, Vibrant Communities does have success stories about communities um, that have really focused on this work and have made traction. And I think if you were to look at your own communities or communities across BC, you would probably see that as well. So we know that having a focused approach to poverty reduction actually does make uh, systems shift and actually net some real results. And um, uh, Kirsty showed you those results of the 13 cities across Canada. And then we want to build the case for larger systems change, whether it's systems change um, within the organizations that are providing services, but also within the larger system. Um, you've already seen this slide. Um, this, is, this is vibrant communities approach uh, to poverty reduction. Um, so that comprehensive thinking and action really builds on that what is it that's impacting our community and then what are the strategies that we might undertake to really drive forward change and then leveraging the assets that already exist in our communities. Um, there's lots of roles that different partners can play and this slide really gives you a sense of those roles um, and I really want you to, I really want to encourage you to be very creative, right? And ask people what role do they want to play in the poverty reduction work that's happening in your community. Um, you know, we know that this focus, the work that you're engaged in does have results, right? But we have to be better at measuring how we're doing in our local communities and um, how we're getting to results and communicating those measures in a much more effective kind of way. So here's some of the evaluation cha challenges um, in terms of these kind of comprehensive multi-sectoral strategies, right? Some of the challenges that we face in terms of coming up with a common evaluation framework. Um, I think what we've done at Vibrant Communities is really try to tackle this in a way that looks at, you know, thinking about, okay, so what, in each of the communities, what's the theory of change that we see, right? So in Saskatoon, for example, if you think back to that slide, they have a very kind of comprehensive layered approach to their poverty strategy. So that's their theory of change. Then what are they going to do in each of those areas that's going to drive the change forward? And then what are their results that they're trying to get at? And then how do they contribute to the cross Canada learning that we have around, um, around this poverty reduction work? Um, Again, this kind of goes into a little bit more detail about how we do it at Vibrant Communities, but I would say, you know, in the, the comprehensive work that you're doing in BC, in the communities that you're working in, can you come up with a common evaluation framework? And I think when I did that uh, day-long facilitation, we started to identify the things that you had in common across the community. So, what would it mean to show progress? And what would it mean not only to show progress at your local community level, but also the progress that you're achieving collectively um, across the communities that you're working with in BC? A way of looking at progress are kind of four core measures. What's the, what are the measures that you want around community engagement? What are the measures around you know, the programs and services or the innovative practices that you're putting into play across the communities that you're working through in BC? What is some of that policy and system measure? So a policy or a systems change might be that you know, 
um, different organizations are coming together and they put to, they built a food bank in the community or new funding has come into the community to advance a certain area. So those are policy and systems change measures. And then are we seeing, uh, as a result of this work, are we seeing a net decrease in the number of people that are living in poverty? And so those are kind of the four big measure categories that we look at from a vibrant communities perspective. But I would also encourage you in BC to think about, you know, are do these categories resonate with you? And could you build a bit of a story around the impact that you're having at your local community um, levels and then across the community investments, a story around these, this impact and the measures that are happening and the changes that you're seeing. Um, so here's a little bit of uh, breaking down those measures in a, in, from a, you know, what would it look like tangibly, right? So what are some of the changes in policy? What are the changes in service and support systems? And we'd be really happy um, at Vibrant Communities and through the work that Kirsty and Natasha are doing to help you guys think about those, right? To think about what's your collective impact and the collective change that you're making. And I know that, um, you know, when we were, uh, when we gathered the, the cities together, um, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we had some of the early discussions and the early dialogue about this. From an asset building perspective, Vibrant Communities uses a sustainable asset, um, the Sustainable Livelihoods Assets Pentagon. And so you, you remember I uh, had a slide where I said, okay, so a pathway out of poverty is building assets in five categories. So what we've been able to do, and when Kirsty said, you know, that we saw over the course of 10 years, you know, um, 439,000 assets being built for 202,000 households, we use this asset building Pentagon as a way of tracking those assets, right? A, a way of really saying, okay, in Calgary, you're developing an affordable transportation um, policy, which means that low-income families are saving every month, um, you know, $35 on paying for their bus pass or their transportation pass. So that is a financial asset, right? It's an income savings that those individuals, and that's impacting, you know, um, 37,000 people. So we could track that asset in a really kind of measurable way. But similarly, we could say, um, you know what? a training program, a financial literacy program that has 32 people involved in a six week training course. So we have 32 people that are being impacted by that skills, knowledge, education asset. So it's a really interesting way of saying, okay, so yes, we wanna net reduce um, the number of people living in poverty, but we understand that building assets is a way of doing that. And how do we track the building of assets? And that's kind of the approach that we took at Vibrant Communities and continue to take at Vibrant Communities. And so something to think about from your perspectives in BC, if you're trying to really look at impact, you know, and you have a whole variety of things that are already going on in, in your communities, how do you track your collective impact, right? Not only the impact that you're having in your local communities, but also the collective impact um, so that you can make a better case for why poverty reduction um, strategies are, are helpful, but also the impact that it's making. Um, so really quickly, what have we learned that we need to create this new space for dialogue so that new conversation about poverty, really, really critical that we do know that the work that you're doing in the cities that you're working in around these comprehensive poverty reduction strategies, we know at Vibrant Communities Canada, and we can say definitively that it does make a difference, right? That it does begin to shift the systems. And I'm sure that you have those stories as well. And I know I heard those stories when I presented to you guys in BC. So absolutely this work is making a huge impact, not only in your communities, but we see it across Canada as well. These are the factors that are critical to get this to happen, right? That you need to have research that informs the work, that you do need to have a clearly articulated purpose. You need to take that theory and you meet, need to make it practical for your communities. Really, really important kind of stuff. And I think that that's why you're investing time to be on this call today and to have some questions about that. And 
in many ways it aligns with the kind of collective impact framework that was launched in the in the US in uh, 2011 this work that we're doing this poverty reduction work has many of the elements of collective impact um, uh, embedded in the process so I, I like the collective impact framework because it provides us with another way of talking about this work so I'm gonna stop there and actually bring Natasha back in I know we have not very many minutes about 10 minutes left but are there any questions um, Natasha that people raised um, during the course of the presentation or if any questions um, came up for you as I was going through those slides really quickly you put them into the chat box now sure um, there were just a couple of um, things a couple of quick things that I wanted to reiterate that came through um, one of them is um, that these like that this PowerPoint um, will be provided for everybody um, as well as the recording um, and that the mayor summit is going to be happening in Edmonton Alberta in April from April 5th to the 7th we did have one statement about um, the myths of poverty Rana wrote in to us um, I agree with all the points about the myths of poverty however um, we do know that there are more in general uh, so that we can provide data to counteract these myths, such as um, the 26% of people that have full-time jobs, um, for example, that fraud does occur in 10% of cases. Uh, we do know that people abuse the system in her own experience. Uh, when Rana moved to Ontario, BC, um, from Ontario to BC, um, Rana underwent, uh, was on employment, unemployment assistance, um, and if and if she hadn't, she would have worked at jobs um, that she didn't really want to instead of waiting to find the perfect thing. Not only did it help uh, her emotional state or get her out of connecting with people, building a network, um, as, we know, as we all know, lots of jobs aren't advertised traditionally. It's still, in a lot of cases, who you don't know or being in the right place at the same time. Also, because of the EI system, you get some work you lose the EI that could really help you get over the hump. Um, yeah. It allows you to buy appropriate clothes for the job and help with transportation, etc. I think uh, absolutely. I, I really value. We just kind of gave you a, a quick list of them, um, but I really value that um, uh, your um, your comments, Rona, in terms of um, raising those points. There, there are. I think, I think we have to, in this poverty reduction work, we have to actually have data that is helpful to us in terms of having these kinds of conversations. And then we actually have to probe a little bit deeper around some of the myths and some of the stigma behind poverty, right? Because, you know, yes, um, there, there, there is abuse for sure in every system that we work in, right? So there's abuse in, in you know, uh, people who live in poverty, but there's equal amount of abuse in people that are working full time and earning incomes and all those other kinds of things. What I think we have to probe about is what, you know, what's the root cause behind that, right? Why, what are the structural barriers in the system? So it's not about the issue, but what are the structural barriers in the system? And then how do we help people navigate through those barriers, right? So how do we connect people to, you know, the hidden employment market that might be available in our community, those kinds of things. So I think in your comment, you're actually, um, you're actually starting to probe a little bit deeper and to go into some of those structural barriers. And I think that that's, that's the way that we've got to kind of turn the conversation or reframe the conversation to, to be able to have authentic conversations about people living in poverty. And it's, you know, we can't um, brush everybody uh, across with the same brush. We really actually have to look at the, the complexity of the issue and the individual impacts that the issue has on people. Thanks. And we actually had another one from uh, Teresa Healy asking you, um, asking us if we talk a little bit more about um, sharing stories, specifically um, significant change. Um, Liz, I know that you have some experience in this. Uh, we were doing it with um, our community campus engagement. I wonder if you can speak to that process a bit. Yeah, well, the, you know, on the Vibrant Communities website, there's a lot of, we, we partnered um, in the first 10 years with um, the Caledon Institute, and we have captured 
uh, Caledon Institute actually wrote community stories. And so if you go onto the Vibrant Communities website and maybe, um, or onto the Caledon uh, website, the Caledon Institute website, there are Vibrant Communities community stories, right? Which are really, they're very cool stories. And, you know, they're, they cover a lot of different kinds of programs and services that uh, communities have been engaged with, you know, around affordable housing, around, um, you know, neighborhood revitalization strategies, around access to transportation. So I encourage you, if there's a particular area that you're interested in, look up those stories and Natasha will include a link to some of the stories. I do think it is important um, to think about, you know, what is the community, what is your, both what is your community current story, what's the change that you're envisioning, and then how is the community starting to move differently around this, um, around this change that you're trying to envision, and I think that stories are really powerful. We, we tend to, in the not-for-profit sector, we tend to bias towards stories. Um, I would say um, they are really important, and, but we also need to include the actual tangible impacts that are being made and the change that we're starting to see in our communities as a result of this working together. So story is good for sure. It, it actually gets you to a very personal level, but then I think it is also Combining the story with tangible data as well is critical. Um, uh, there, uh, the, yeah, I, we're coming to one o'clock. So uh, Natasha, maybe that's uh, another webinar that we could do on, you know, positive stories, or we could include some of the links. We know that uh, we were trying to only keep people to one o'clock for this call. I would agree. I think there's um, a couple more comments slash questions that we could hold full webinars on too. Um, so maybe yeah. we'll leave those up and we'll put some resources together and send them out afterwards. Yeah, so what we'll do, that's a great idea, Natasha. What we'll do is we'll pull all of your questions from the chat box, and then if we have some um, additional resources in each of the question areas, uh, we will put the questions there. We won't um, attach them to a certain person. There'll be uh, questions that we've just received, not necessarily you'll put your name beside it, and then we'll, um, if we have resources that are helpful to you, we'll attach those in as well. Um, uh, so, I know that we've just come up to 1 o'clock Ontario time and early in the morning for all of you guys in BC. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us on this webinar. We hope it's been helpful to you. We certainly for sure um, want to continue to uh, engage you in conversations. We know that the work that you're doing in your communities across BC is really, really valuable work and we want to encourage you to continue to do the work um, that you're doing. And uh, there, again, are lots of resources on the Vibrant Communities website, www.vibrantcommunities.ca. Um, and so we'd encourage you to do what we say at Tamarack, R&D, rip off and duplicate. Um, but for sure, reach out to Kirsty or Natasha if you have any more questions or when you get the PowerPoint or resources, if that brings up any more questions for you, um, be sure to reach out to them as well.